Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. This is the first chapter of making the creature Zorak. This is going to be a longer video. I will be showing you my workflow from concept sculpting all the way to creating model turntables in Maya and Arnold. But first, I want to thank everyone for their encouragement and the kind words shared on my first YouTube video. I appreciate the time you spend watching my videos and really hope you find them helpful in creating your own art. As you can see, I already started from a sphere to block out the concept sculpt, which is a question I get a lot, which mesh to start from. For your own projects, feel free to start from a sphere, base mesh, or face plane model in ZBrush, whatever helps you in creating the concept you have in mind. And at the end of the day, it's the concept stage anyway, so it's very forgiving. After forming the main shapes of the head and neck, I start by adding the Skulls Pony landmarks at the model's early stages. And the concept I had in mind was for a creature with his mouth open and possibly canine teeth sticking out. So right from the beginning, I started by carving in the mouth socket, then masking and rotating the jaw to drop the jaw slightly. And again, mainly focusing on the bony landmarks and the shapes at this stage, not concerned about any secondary shapes. And when you drop the jaw, it will affect the ear slightly and a lot of the muscles and the skin around the mouth and cheeks. I always treat the scalp the way I approach real clay in real life. I build the clay mass and keep carving more details in layers and passes. Of course, in digital sculpting, we can undo or go back to earlier sculpt if we wanted to. However, I have always enjoyed approaching digital sculpting this way. Now, as you can see, I've begun adding more face planes and started hinting for secondary forms. It's time to add spheres for the eyes and begin refining the eye socket, eyelids, and the surrounding area. Make sure you give the eyes enough volume from the beginning to shape the eyelids. And depending on the anatomy of the person you are sculpting, you might need to emphasize the brow ridge and the glabella and above the eye socket. It adds stronger features to the face. To lock out the shape of the teeth and the gums, I added a sphere. I first marked the middle line where the upper and lower teeth are separated. And of course, once you add the teeth, there will be more updates on the jaw and the areas around the mouth. And quickly updating the skull shape while adding the teeth. Back to the teeth and gums, I duplicated the same sphere to use it for the upper teeth, shaping inside the upper gums and just the overall shape. And now I roughly place the shape for the upper teeth in terms of size and length. And then jumping to the bottom teeth to shape them quickly. At this stage, I'm doing the same thing I did for the head, which is blocking the main shapes and volumes for the teeth and the gums. My goal is to put everything together and see how it reads and keep adjusting the teeth and the mouth as I go. And there's no commitment to any design at this stage. I could sculpt more teeth, make them longer or shorter or smaller. It's always good to have a version of the idea you have in mind and that version is visible on the canvas which helps in forming a better judgment or possibly more ideas. I keep jumping from one spot to another to avoid spending too much time sculpting in one area. It also helps in bringing the model slowly up to the next level. Then come back to the same area with fresh eyes later and continue sculpting. A lot of times I step away for half an hour or so then come back to have a look with fresh eyes, which helps me spot my mistakes or gives me more design ideas. Ideally, you don't want to finish the whole concept in a few hours. It's best to spend a couple of days working on it, just to help you spot the mistakes you made a few days earlier and also help you develop a better take on the current design. Locking out the primary shapes and mouth is done. I'll transfer XYZ base mesh and continue sculpting on a clean geometry. Jumping in Maya with the decimated sculpt, I scaled the concept mesh to 24.5 cm in height for the face. I'm working in centimeters by the way, and I roughly lined up the XYZ head to my sculpt and sent them both to wrap 3D. In my previous tutorial, the making of 3D female portrait, I demonstrated the wrap workflow in details. 
I will also use it in chapter two on how to texture the creature Zorak. So I'll save you time by showing you other stuff in this video. After projecting the sculpt on the clean base mesh, I spent a good amount of time inspecting and cleaning up the model before moving on to the next step, mainly around the thin areas of the mesh, such as the nose, the ears, and the eyelids. Since this is going to be the final base mesh, I like to start sculpting on very clean base mesh. With a clean mesh for the head established, it's time to model the teeth and the gums properly. To begin with the teeth, I started with poly modeling in Maya. I shaped one tooth roughly to align with my concept mesh from ZBrush. I used Maya sculpting tools and added sufficient resolution as a base. The objective is to roughly match the concept with a clean geometry at this stage. Knowing that the majority of the actual shaping and detailing will be done in ZBrush. So I continued by duplicating the main tooth and aligning it with the next one, spending a bit of time shaping it to match the concept sculpt. I repeated this process until I constructed both the upper and the lower teeth. You can start from building the teeth and gums first in Maya, then importing them in ZBrush. I like to have a concept sculpt as a reference first. Not only you can use it for retopology, but also as a reference to build the right proportions for the base mesh. Now I'm moving on to the gums using the concept mesh to block out the proportions for the outer shell. Then I extruded inwards to get the right thickness. Then I reversed the normals since I extruded inwards. I extruded the faces around the base of each tooth. Then I continued reshaping the mesh to roughly match the concept mesh. Of course, I worked on half of the model, then mirrored the other half later. I applied a smooth operation to the mesh to have sufficient resolution to shape the gums around each tooth. And I believe this is going to be the final base mesh resolution. And just like the teeth, there will be proper sculpting in ZBrush. And pretty much that's how I approach the upper teeth and gums as well. Back in ZBrush, we now have clean base meshes for the teeth and gums. We can start the final sculpt by shaping them correctly, adding more volume and adjusting the position slightly to break up the CG look. I'm not adding surface level details just yet, but I'm making sure the teeth and the gums are sitting in the mouth nicely and accurately. Even though I know I'm not going to see the teeth and gums from inside the mouth, I still give them a good overall sculpting pass, not only for a better look, but it will also be more accurate in shading when it comes time to applying subsurface scattering. I have a collection of teeth and gum models that I've created for various characters in the past. However, for this tutorial, my goal is to demonstrate how to start the process from scratch in case you prefer creating your own. Just like the head model, if you already have a base mesh for the teeth and gums, don't hesitate to reuse it and reshape it to suit your needs. Now that I almost completed the initial pass sculpt of the creature in symmetry mode, I'll make some final tweaks before moving on to breaking the symmetry and diving into more exciting sculpting details. And I don't mean uber surface level details, but more of detailed features on the face, such as thick skin, prominent fat pads, and few certain muscles, very distinguished features that you can read from a distance when you render your model. And in my case, this is the stage where I spent most of my time when creating creatures. So I started by adding overall lines around the nose, eyes, and lips. And then started by sculpting in asymmetry on one side first. Defining more of the lips on one side. Then I added the memory wrinkles under the chin and the side of the face as a guide to define the thick skin, which is pretty much how I approach sculpting thick skin and folds and wrinkles. I lay out the foundation first with a sharper brush, then with a clay build up, I fill the areas in between. If you notice, I have my own version of clay build up and slash brushes, which basically the clay build up has a wider soft alpha and low values for the lazy mouse. The slash brush I use for the sharp wrinkles is a cologne of ZBrush original slash brush with a small sharp alpha in it and also low values for the lazy mouse. References is crucial, especially at this stage. I have tons of references on the other monitor 
which is a huge reference of、uh, humans and animals. Images with deformed teeth, a lot of God of War and World of Warcraft references. I am a big fan of their awesome artwork. I'll find any excuse to add references from these two games to my reference board. Now I'm adding a scar on one side of the upper lip. Using the usual workflow by defining the size and direction of the scar, then use a clay build up to add more volume around it, and then I started adding more shapes and thickness to the overall shape of the lip. Aside from the primary shapes, this is the part, in my opinion, that you should bet your money on. This will bring the model to life and make it very interesting. The workflow I developed over the years is to sculpt in symmetry first to block the primary and secondary shapes. Then, at this stage, I spend as much time, if not more, breaking the symmetry and add features on the model in non symmetrical areas. Now I'm adding more thickness and defining more creases in between the thick nasolabial fold and his cheek. There is no shortcut for this process. You need to invest the time and effort in creating the right shapes and volumes. It could be very time consuming. But in my opinion, it's worth investing the time and effort. You'll be much happier with the end result of your sculpt. Now I'm running over the lips to ensure they have enough breakup in the surface. Also, make sure they sit nicely against the gums. I often keep jumping from one area to another as usual, adding more surface breakup. Also, give my eyes a break from looking at one spot for too long. I'm breaking the symmetry even more on the nose and the nostrils, adding more of the thick skin and surface breakup around that area. Depends on human age. One of the main obvious asymmetrical features of the face is the nose and the eyes. And for creatures, I always tend to emphasize breaking the symmetry even more in those areas. I think the mouth and the jaw is in good shape for now. So, I expanded the skin folds around the chin and moving on to the neck as well. Probably a lot of you know that already, but for those who d o e s n t know, you can expand selection by holding Ctrl Shift then X, and you can shrink your selection by holding Ctrl Shift then S. And I have assigned a hotkey for solo mode to isolate the current subtool. Which is very handy for isolating the head and hiding the eyes or the teeth while sculpting tight or hidden areas. Now I'm moving from the lower part of the head to start sculpting more details on the eyes. And yes, you've guessed it, I'm using my slash brush to lay down the foundation for the wrinkles. And then I will be using the clay build up to give the areas in between the thickness. Pretty much the same approach I took on the mouth and the jaw area. One crucial aspect of sculpting the eyelids is thickness. Make sure you have enough eyelid thickness in your characters. It contributes significantly to the realism of the facial anatomy. I closed the eyelids for the left eye ever so slightly. Now I'm sculpting additional forms on the upper eyelid and around the orbital socket. I'm focusing on smaller forms at this stage. While slightly hinting for cross crossing skin around the eye and in general. When sculpting dense skin, it's important to consider the impact of gravity over time. Creating more definition in the pockets and shaping the contours of the thicker skin around that belly, which is the middle section of that fold. And like I said earlier, I always try to add more thickness in the middle of the wrinkles and in between creases. While considering the direction of gravity, of course. I always keep looking at the overall forms just to make sure everything reads well and it's the way I want it to look. Again, I highly recommend taking long breaks while sculpting and come back with a fresh eye. And as you can see, I frequently switch up the lighting and materials, turning the model to view from different angles. When it comes to materials, I usually stick with the basic materials in ZBrush because it gives you an honest representation of the model. I only tweak the color and specular values. If I find settings I like, I might save it as a new material. But all of my materials are based on ZBrush basic material, which is, I find, pretty straightforward and reliable. 
and I occasionally press P on the keyboard to switch back and forth between orthographic and perspective modes. This helps me read the model from different perspectives, which in the end it does impact my judgment on updating certain aspects of the model. And now I'm laying down the foundation for the forehead wrinkles by adding memory wrinkles and folds. Now you know my workflow, I'll be adding more forms and volume in between the creases. I usually do quick pass for the wrinkle design first, mainly to see how it connects with other wrinkly areas on the face. I'm not committed to any wrinkle design at this stage. If I don't like it, I'm not afraid to change it again. I will keep updating it until I'm happy and satisfied with the look. But mainly I have one specific reference or two on the other monitor that has specific features I'm trying to replicate on my model. It could be from a human or even animal. Okay, it's time to sculpt the teeth properly. It will help shape the mouth better. First, I don't like to keep the teeth symmetrical. No one has symmetrical teeth, let alone creatures. So I'll start by breaking the shapes individually for each tooth. That will bring more realism to the mouth overall. And then I will reshape them and make them look like a crooked teeth. And for this pass, I will add a little bit of cracking and chipping randomly on each tooth. I also make sure I sculpt and shape the volume from inside of the mouth. That will help to shape them even better. Also, I want to give the geometry a good volume for the subsurface scattering to travel through. And while I'm at it, I keep updating the gums at the same time, just to make sure they are sitting as they should inside the gums. And I always check how the lips look like while I'm updating the teeth and the gums, if there's any updates required, which most of the time there is. And then I refine the uh, shapes for the gums to make them sit nicely inside the mouth. And that was the quick pass for the teeth. There wasn't much to it really. Then I continued refining the face. From here, it's a matter of dedicating time and effort to another area of the head. The level of detail you want in the model is directly proportional to the time you spend sculpting it. From my experience, this is what distinguishes a quick model with minimal sculpting time from one that has more time and effort invested. In production, and many artists in visual effects houses are aware of this, it's a topic we often discuss at work. It comes down to the cost of the model, client negotiations, and role of the character in the shot, whether it's a hero character, mid or background character. All these factors significantly influences the amount of details we need to add in the model. However, for personal projects, I believe you should do whatever you like and have fun with it. Take the time you need and enjoy the process and learn along the way. After all, it's your project, so create characters and art that you are passionate about. That's at least how I approach it. Now let's add more details to the lips in asymmetrical mode. Starting with the lower lip border by sculpting smaller creases. Then I sculpt sharp lines on the lips first to define the deep creases we see on the lips making sure to place them randomly. And even though they may appear vertically, I try to break up the direction of the lines ever so slightly for more natural and human-like look. Then with a clay builder brush, I keep adding more volume in between the creases to mimic the cushion-like areas on the lips. I like to have the borderline very well defined. I tend to exaggerate the details on the lips. However, a lot of these creases and details will look softer when applying subsurface scattering. Also making sure not to extend the scalp all the way inside the mouth. I'm avoiding adding very fine details. I will get that from adding texture XYZ displacement. My goal is to add mid to large details on the lips, just enough to show up from a distance in render time. So even though I'm sure I probably won't see the tongue inside the mouth, still I just wanted to have a geometry that represents the tongue. I will not spend the time sculpting details on it, but having the mesh in there with basic texture is a good safety net. While sculpting all the fine details could be fun to do, there is no point in investing the time on it. So after sculpting the basic shape, I'll re the decimated mesh, give it a quick UVs, then add it to the mouth group. Okay, let's create the eye setup. I imported the decimated eyes from ZBrush for size reference. For the Scalera geometry, I created a cube, then subdivided the mesh four times in Maya. 
Then from the deformation menu, I added a scalp modifier, then scaled up the modifier larger than the subdivided cube. And that's how I created perfectly rounded sphere with all quad mesh without any triangles in the bulge of the cornea. Then I added another scalp modifier, then resized it and moved it in Z to shape the bulge of the cornea. The size is roughly half of the radius of the sclera. For the iris, I started from sphere and scaled it down in Z axis. Then with a soft select, I pushed it in from the center to form slightly concave disc. I positioned the iris closer to the base of the cornea. Then I deleted half of the disc and I moved it roughly even closer to the radius of the cornea. I extruded the edges a bit more. Then I deleted the faces in the center to create a hole for the pupil. And after deleting some of the resolution, I lost some of the concave uh, quality to the disc. So I pushed the center back in Z a little bit further. And I did a little bit of reshaping until I was happy with the overall shape of the iris. And finally, I added a geometry for the pupil and roughly placed it behind the extrusion of the iris. And right from the beginning, I wanted to create a shader for the sclera. That will help me decide how big or small the opening for the iris in the sclera. So I connected an AI ramp and connected the R channel to the transmission uh, to the sclera shader, which is an AI standard surface shader. And usually I connected to the diffuse channel as well in the AI standard surface, just to view the ramp in my viewport and just make sure you change the ramp uh, type to circular. And from here, it's just a matter of controlling the color slider in the ramp to control how much you want to show the iris through the sclera. And now I rename and group everything correctly. I have a decimated version of the head in my viewport to help me position the eye correctly in the right place. And once I'm happy and satisfied with the position of the eye, I duplicate it and enter the same negative values in translate X and rotate Y for the duplicated eye. And then eventually I will freeze the transformation and delete the history before the final render. Okay, so let's work on the iris. Since I'm sculpting realistic details on the head and the skin for this project, I've decided to sculpt the iris in ZBrush to achieve a realistic look. I imported a version of the geometry to ZBrush and will be sculpting on one iris. I will be applying the final displacement map to both eyes since they share the same UVs and geometry. So I use radial symmetry to paint a mask on the iris. And then I either sculpt inside the mask or outside the mask to form deep pockets and fibers. And then following the reference of my other monitor, I keep turning off the symmetry occasionally and focus on sculpting on one region to give it a specific shape or form. These shapes will capture specular highlights and shadows, giving the iris a very interesting look in close-up renders. My goal is to create detailed iris that is readable from distance without becoming too distracting or noisy. And the texture maps I create in Mari will complement the displacement when I start look diving the iris. I should say I don't do this for every single project. There is no point of recreating the map if you have it already. Unless I have a specific look for that character or creature that I want to recreate, I either reuse the map and geometry I created from previous projects, or use maps like Texture XYZ, which will do the job just fine. So I think at this stage, the iris has enough details for model turntable. I will add more details when we start texturing the eye. So let's move on to other elements of the eye setup. So let's jump into sculpting the caruncle, which is the small gland sitting at the corner of the eye in between the upper and the lower eyelids. It is a very basic shape I created in Maya, which is Maya standard plane subdivided a couple of times and I extruded it to give it some thickness. Then I imported it in ZBrush for further sculpting. I just wanted to sculpt and form that organic triangular shape sitting at the corner of the eye. I didn't want to add so much details on it. I will add more details in LookDev via texture maps if required. 
So now I'm building the geometry that I'll be using to create the wet look in the eye. You see it more visible in the lower eyelid, but you definitely need to extend the geometry to the upper eyelid as well. And as you can see, I extended the geometry to cover the caruncle as well for softer transition. And then I will control the transparency via texture maps. This is very important geometry, not only to simulate the wet look in the eye, but also to kill the CG look between the sclera, caruncle, and the eyelids. It contributes to softening the transition between all these geometries. It doesn't have to be very complicated geometry. Very simple two rows running around the crease of the sclera will do the trick. And now that I have finished building all the necessary geometries and finished the final sculpt for the head, I'll move on to sculpting and designing the costume. For the concept design stage, I tend to start with primitives and then convert them to Dynamesh. Then I either append a new one or duplicate the current one and keep shaping it as I go. And from here, I use my mover brush and my clay buildup and slash brushes. I keep shaping the bigger forms first and add the main design features by extracting or duplicating the original mesh. In many cases where I have the full body, which is not the case for this project, I use a lot of extract with thickness and then convert it to Dynamesh for further sculpting. So after creating the main geometries and the volume for each piece, I try to go back and give thickness or sharp edges. And at this stage, I'm just playing with ideas to see what works for him. I always have an idea about the overall design in my head. And the next step is when I transfer the idea on the canvas and then it will be an eye opener to update the design and make sure all of the design talk to each other and reads well with the character. Now I'm adding another sphere for the collar piece. And first I shape it around his neck, then make sure I create enough volume to reshape it better. Then keep refining the outside to get that curve around the neck. For me, I find this approach is very freeing. I appreciate the lack of technical constraints and the freedom from constantly going back and forth between ZBrush and Maya, or any software for that matter, which tends to slow down the creative process, at least in my case. I like to stay in ZBrush completely while doing the concept, then deal with the technical issues later. Now that I extended the collar down to his chest, I'm making sure everything's sitting nicely and fitting all together. And I knew from the beginning I wanted to create one piece, as in one geometry for the suit, other than the shoulder pads, they're going to be separate geometries. And of course, when you merge Dynamics geometries, you will get few artifacts. So I'm running on the surface with a smoother brush just to clean up these artifacts and making sure the surface is nice and clean. And also with the slasher brush, I started introducing the seams and giving the seams more sharp edges. And with a clay brush, I added a little bit of thickness and sharpness to the edge of the color. I kept in mind while designing these seams in ZBrush that I will be modeling them separately in Maya as a separate geometry so I can assign different material and different surface qualities to them. And for the seams, I knew I wanted to introduce more interesting shapes to them. And to be honest, while concepting, I wasn't sure which direction I want to go with. But in the end, I ended up liking what I'm doing. So I kept going with the flow and kept sharpening them and adding more definition to the seams. So building on that design, I decided to make it a feature in the suit. So I am big on making the whole design speaks the same language. So I went ahead and implemented the seam design on the shoulder pads, the collar and the suit. And I think at this stage, I ended up liking where it's going. So I kept refining them with thickness and sharpening the edges on each piece. I should mention that I didn't want to design a very complicated suit. Therefore, I wanted to create a simple, elegant design as much as I can and probably add more details in texture and look depth. And for this process, the main goal is to create a 3D concept of the idea I had in mind. The quality of the mesh is not important at all. I knew I will end up decimating the whole mesh, and in the end, this mesh will serve as a reference in Maya, either for topology or proportion reference to build a few elements more accurately with a clean geometry. 
So I always try to lock the design at the conceptual phase and avoid changing it while texturing and look dipping. And that's my main focus at the current stage. So design wise, the suit is pretty much done. I am just giving a few edges more sharpness or thickness to make my life easier in Maya and would be easier to separate the stripes or the seams to their own geometry. So I think it's time to decimate it and send it to Maya and let's start the retopology process. The topology for the suit is pretty straightforward workflow. Even though there won't be any cloth simulation on the suit, I like to keep the mesh as quad as possible. I started by tracing the main large shapes, then trace the panels in between. And the first large shape I wanted to start from was the collar. So I started by placing my topology quads on the edges, then moved down to the base of the collar. The goal is to identify the panels that construct the suit, and then connect the panels in a clean way and make the poly flow work together. Personally, I don't spend too much time adding resolution in one area. I like to work in passes. If there's one area that needs more resolution, then I will go and add it later, just to keep the topology as clean as possible. I find working in low resolution first speed up my workflow. Also, I won't be overwhelmed with a lot of polys while I'm trying to solve the topology puzzle. So my goal at this stage is to create a base mesh that is clean as possible with easy to read poly flow. Even though there will be no deformation on the suit, as a habit, I like to keep the mesh as quad as possible. And I use the triangles to avoid extending loops and redirect the poly flow, and also to avoid creating extra necessary resolution in certain places. I like using the quad draw tool in Maya. It allows me to be creative in designing the topology exactly the way I want it. It is probably one of the best plugin acquisitions that Autodesk has ever added to Maya. And topology workflow is a very crucial skill for modeling. It will come with practice and by studying different models over time. But it's not that complicated once you get the hang of it. A lot of times I do short projects and sometimes I do long projects. And for the long projects, I try to create more challenging costumes every now and then, just to practice topology as well. And I might throw hard surface elements occasionally in the design to practice hard surface modeling as well. Maybe for the next tutorial, I'll create a hybrid organic and hard surface character. So from here, I continue to block out the whole topology for the whole suit. And you'll see I smooth the edge sometimes by holding shift and running the brush on the edge only, and then smooth the internal topology afterwards. This will help in creating even distribution of the topology and makes the suit sit perfectly on the live mesh. So for the seams or the golden pieces on the suit, I decided to model them as separate geometries. They will stand out better as a feature. And I'll also end up assigning totally different materials to both the suit and the golden pieces. I've also imported Maya viewport shaders from previous hard surface projects I've worked on in the past. These shaders do not contribute to the final render. They are just visually appealing shaders in Maya's viewport while modeling. And then I continue to trace the shapes of the golden pieces on the suit while designing the topology as I go. And this mesh will be the outer shell for the hard surface piece. Next, I extruded inward to create thickness. Then I inverted the normals to make the normals point to the right direction. Now I have a proper mesh for the golden pieces. I continue to tweak the mesh to make it sit tight and perfectly on the suit mesh. And of course, go back and forth between the golden pieces and the actual suit mesh. And while I have the decimated mesh live, I continue projecting and smoothing the suit mesh to get the right shapes and volume. So from here, I took the same approach on all of the suit's elements. I also added reinforcement edges and other edges to hold the shape and volumes. And as you noticed, I work on one side first, then mirror the other side later once I'm done with the final retopology. And once we are done in Maya, the next step will be zebrash minor tweaks, which is what we are going to look at next. So here we are in ZBrush. I didn't spend much time sculpting the details on the suit in ZBrush. I knew I'll add more fine details via texture maps in Mari, 
But my goal here is to add more surface tension details between the hard surface pieces and the suit itself. Other than that, I was happy with the base mesh and the topology I created in Maya and the projection from the concept sculpt. So after adding the surface tension details, I moved on to adding V-phase details on the head. For transferring the V-phase maps, I used RAP to transfer all of the maps. They made it very easy and pretty straightforward. You just need to follow the labels on the nodes and load your geometries, change the UDIM number in the edit project script in the file menu, and then hit compute frame range in the save image node. And then when the process is done, you will have all of the maps transferred in the export folder. Back in ZBrush, make sure you store a morph target on the highest subdivision level first, then use the UDIM importer plugin to import the V-phase displacement, enable the process EXR before import, and make sure you select all the UDIMs when you load all the files, then hit import displacement. And now because we stored a morph target, we can use the morph brush to paint out the artifacts or the undesired areas on the mesh. And that's the benefits of storing the original mesh in a morph target before applying the displacement. With the morph brush, you can erase and move back to the original mesh with the desired intensity. And now as a final touch is before starting rendering in Arnold, I started sharpening more areas on the sculpt while having the displacement on separate layer. I ended up setting the displacement to 0.5 before exporting the final displacement. I should mention with my new workflow, I don't export the final displacement while XYZ displacement layer enabled anymore. I use them directly in render time after I clean them up in Mari. But it is nice to import them in ZBrush and enhance few areas on the model. And also I wanted to share the workflow on how to import XYZ displacement in ZBrush. Okay, now the final model with the high res details are done. Let's export the displacement and start rendering in Maya and Arnold. Here we are at the final stage of rendering the turntable. I started by importing a light rig I created a while ago. It's a rig that has multiple AI sky dome light in one group. I have studio, sunny, overcast, and three points lighting set up. And I keep switching back and forth between these light rigs in log dev process. And for the custom three point light rig, it is very simple rig. I have a sky dome that has solid color to fill the shadows. I have a key light shooting from the top left and I have two rim lights shooting from the back. I guess I really should call it four points light rig after enabling the sky dome. And the focal length for my render camera is set to 50 millimeter. I like to render in either 50 or 85 millimeter cameras for characters. 50 and 85 are my favorite two lenses for rendering portraiture. For the meniscus and the sclera, I created an AI shader and assigned it to the meniscus first and simply cranked up the transmission value all the way up to 1. And for the Scalera, I reused the ramp I created earlier in the tutorial, and then plugged the R channel from the ramp to the transmission weight of the AI standard shader. And since I have one ZBrush displacement for the whole character, I created one shader for the whole character turntable. I created an AI standard surface, and set the diffuse weight all the way up to 1. In the diffuse color, I switched it to data since I'm working in ACES color space and set the HSV value to 0.18. For the roughness, I set the value to 0.5 to start with, which I'm sure I will change it later, but it is good neutral value to start from. Then I applied an Arnold subdivision to all geometries in the character group, setting the type to Cat Clark and the iteration to 3 to start with, and the adaptive error is set to 2. And to connect the displacement, I created the file node first. You can use an AI image if you like. The default displacement nodes in Arnold assumes the middle value of the displacement map is zero. So I'm adding an AI subtract node to offset the value by 0.5. Since I exported the map from ZBrush with 0.5 mid value, then connected the out color R from the subtract node to the displacement shader node. And of course we have multiple UDIMs, so I'll change the tiles mode to UDIM Mari. And the displacement from ZBrush is a raw file, so we need to change the color space to utility raw for the displacement to render correctly. And the displacement is rendering as it should. So I'll go ahead and apply it to every mesh in the group minus the sclera and the meniscus. 
And that's it. That's how I render my ZBrush displacement in Maya and Arnold. So we reached the end of chapter one of creating the creature Zorak. I'll be texturing and look up the character in the next chapter. I want to thank everyone for sticking around and for the support. I really appreciate your time. I hope this tutorial will help you in creating your own art and I'm looking forward to see what you're going to create next. Thank you very much and see you in the next one.